Well, good morning and welcome to Trinity Reformed Church. Our call to worship this morning comes from the 149th Psalm. It says, Praise the Lord. Sing to the Lord a new song and His praise in the assembly of saints. Let Israel rejoice in their Maker. Let the children of Zion be grateful in their King. Let them praise His name with the dance. Let them sing praises to Him with the timbrel and harp. For the Lord takes pleasure in His people. He will beautify the humble with salvation. Let the saints be joyful in glory. Let them sing aloud on their beds. Let the high praises of God be in their mouth. Greetings to you in the name of God, the Father, and His only Son, Jesus Christ. Come, let's worship our living God. Al, I'd like to invite you now to open your uh, Bibles to Daniel chapter 1. Daniel chapter 1. We're going to be reading the whole chapter. It's 21 verses, but it kind of goes together. We're actually going to be looking at this chapter uh, for at least a couple weeks, uh, maybe even a third, but at least for a couple weeks. Daniel chapter 1. Here is the reading of God's Word. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand with some of the articles of the house of God, which he carried into the land of Shinar, to the house of his God, and brought the articles into the treasure house of his God. Then the king instructed Ashpenaz, the master of his eunuchs, to bring some of the children of Israel and some of the king's descendants and some of the nobles, young men in whom there was no blemish, but good-looking, gifted in all wisdom, possessing knowledge and quick to understand, who had ability to serve in the king's palace and whom they might teach the language and literature of the Chaldeans. The king appointed for them a daily provision of the king's delicacies and of the wine which he drank, three years of training for them, so that at the end of that time they might serve before the king. Now from among those of the sons of Judah were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. To them the chief of the eunuchs gave names. He gave Daniel the name Belteshazzar, to Hananiah Shadrach, to Mishael Meshach, and to Azariah Abednego. But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with a portion of the king's delicacies, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore, he requested of the chief of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. Now God had brought Daniel into the favor and goodwill of the chief of the eunuchs. And the chief of the eunuchs said to Daniel, I fear my lord the king who has appointed your food and drink. For why should he see your faces looking worse than the young men who are your age? Then you would endanger my head before the king. So Daniel said to the steward, whom the chief of the eunuchs had set over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, Please, test your servants for ten days and let them give us vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then let our appearance be examined before you and the appearance of the young men who eat the portion of the king's delicacies. And as you see fit, so deal with your servants. So he consented with them in his, this matter and tested them ten days. And at the end of ten days, their features appeared better and fatter in the flesh than all the young men who ate the portion of the king's delicacies. Thus, the steward took away their portion of delicacies and the wine that they were to drink and gave them vegetables. As for these four men, God gave them knowledge and skill in all literature and wisdom, and Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. Now at the end of the days when the king had said they should be brought in, the chief of the eunuchs brought them in before Nebuchadnezzar. Then the king intervened, excuse me, interviewed them, and among them, all, among them all, none was found like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Therefore, they served before the king. And on all matters of wisdom and understanding about which the king examined them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and astrologers who were in his realm. Thus Daniel continued until the first year of King Cyrus." Here ends the reading of God's Word. 
Let's bow our heads in prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we praise You for bringing us together this morning. Father, we ask that, Lord, our ears and our hearts would be open to You. We ask that we would be open to Your message. That any untruth that I utter would be washed away. Lord, keep my lips from error. Lord, that I might serve You well. That all praise and glory would be unto You. For you, you are our creator and sustainer. Lord, we pray to you in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Daniel's a unique book within the Bible. The Jews didn't lump this book in with the prophetic books. They had categories of major and minor prophets, just as we still do today. But Daniel was found in the Jewish Bible in what are called the writings, which were placed at the end of the list. They believed that this book was, in fact, the Word of God, but they didn't consider Daniel a prophet. To the Jewish mind, a prophet was strictly the go-between between God and his people. God would inspire the prophet to speak and or write God's word to his people. And this is why prophetic books give reference to the word of the Lord coming to the prophet in question. Daniel doesn't do this in a traditional sense. Daniel never says, thus saith the Lord. Of course, in the Holy Bible, we put him in with the major prophets. Uh, mainly due to the size of the book and to the Christian mind, it doesn't really fit anywhere else. It has a lot of historical narrative, but it's not just historical narrative. There are large aspects of prophecy within the writings of Daniel. But much of this prophecy in Daniel is foretelling, predicting or interpreting the future yet to come as... uh, the prophet was used by God. Now, most biblical prophecy is what's called forth telling. It's declaring the will of God. It's when the prophet says, thus saith the Lord, you know, tear down your altars, get rid of your idols, come and worship me, or God is going to punish you. Forth telling is the greatest aspect of the prophecy we see. As I said, it's What comes after the words, thus saith the Lord. This is something that Daniel doesn't do, and that's why the Jews didn't view him as a prophet. What Daniel does do is live a devout life in the service of the Lord in some of the most trying times possible. And Daniel's account of the events surrounding his life should be of great encouragement to all Christians that find themselves in similar circumstances. Now, Daniel was taken into exile when he was young by the Babylonians in 605 B.C. This book was written shortly after, or a little after 539 B.C. in the capture of Babylon by Cyrus. Now, there is some controversy over the date when it was written and the identity of the author, some arguing for a later date during the reign of Antiochus Epiphanes, uh, sometime around 170 B.C. This is argued because those who postulate this say that Daniel couldn't have predicted all that he does, or anything for that matter, and so the writing must be historical in nature rather than prophetic. In other words, what they are doing is denying the inspiration of Daniel. They're denying the sovereignty of God, likely denying the existence of God. There is no evidence that stands up to real scrutiny for this book being written at a later date. It is true that there are many great predictions in Daniel. He lays out the history from the time of his writing all the way to the advent of Jesus Christ some 500 years in the future, he actually predicts the year of Jesus' coming in chapter 9. But these aren't really the most important aspects of the book of Daniel. What I want to show you as we journey through this great work is that the book of Daniel is all about the preeminence of God in all things. That's the sovereignty of God. 
The main theme that runs through this book is that God is in charge at all times. And this is stated in the first two verses of his writings. It reads, In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand with some of the articles of the house of God, which he carried into the land of Shinar to the house of his God. And he brought the articles into the treasure house of his God. Now notice it says, The Lord gave Jehoiakim into the hands of Nebuchadnezzar. I want you to notice what's going on here. Like many kings, Nebuchadnezzar thought the world of himself. He looked out over his world and there's this upstart nation called Israel that says that their God is the best God. Not only that, They say that their God is the creator of everything, the creator of the whole world. They also say that they're a chosen people, the chosen people of their God. And even worse, they don't just say that their God is tougher than the rest of the gods. They say there are no other gods, that the other gods don't even exist. Well, Nebuchadnezzar doesn't like that at all. He thinks that he's better than they are. He's stronger than they are that his God is the top God. It's interesting to note that it did take uh, Nebuchadnezzar three tries to uh, conquer Jerusalem, but it was God that allowed him to do so. And so what we have depicted here is the struggle between man or the world on the one hand and the Lord and his people on the other. The ancient struggle of mankind wanting to prove that he's in charge of his own destiny. And yet, we see that the Lord gave king, the Jehoiakim, the king of Judah, into the hands of Nebuchadnezzar. Daniel is a book that clearly shows that there is only one God and that the Lord God Almighty is sovereign over all that occurs in this universe that he created. The tale of Daniel's life in the service of a secular king is a life that all faithful Christians should both be able to relate to and also to look at as an example of how to live their life for God in the midst of a secular society, even at the highest levels of a secular society. Daniel lived in a time when... If he said the wrong thing or entered the room at the wrong time, Nebuchadnezzar just have him killed. We have so many more protections now, and yet there are so many similarities. Daniel, taken in the proper context, is a wonderful example of how we as Christians can conduct our lives knowing that the Lord is in charge of all that comes to pass. We live in a time that is rife with secular humanism. Secularists think that the world exists for man and his glory rather than God's glory. Nebuchadnezzar was a secular humanist if there ever was one. Just before he was humiliated by God, he says in chapter 4, verse 30, Is not this great Babylon that I have built a royal dwelling by my mighty power and for the honor of my majesty? On a side note, he wasn't the first Nebuchadnezzar. His father was also named Nebuchadnezzar, and he didn't build it all, but he sure thought he did. Nebuchadnezzar thought he was great. This is the same king that showed his might over God by conquering the city of Jerusalem. To be fair, his father was king at the time. He was sent by his father to do so, it seems. But that's still under the auspices of the king. And he took temple furnishings out of the temple of God, placed them in his own temple. It's a sign of being more powerful than the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. Nebuchadnezzar was obsessed with his own glory. That's what the world is obsessed with. Man is obsessed with the glory of man, not the glory of God. Just look at the theory of evolution. 
Look out on our society today. Have you ever wondered why it's so popular? Why is this the only thing you can teach in the schools? Why are the schools so adamant about it being the only idea of the creation of the universe and the advent of man that must be even discussed? According to the theories surrounding evolution, everything is in direct relation to everything else. The thing that came before is the cause of the thing that comes after, and so on, and so on, so that if you follow it to its reasonable end, everything can be known. And predictions even of the future can be made just by following the causal relationships. It's not God that defines creation anymore. It's man. In the theory of evolution, only the strong survive. And so man, being the strongest, is the top of the food chain. It is man that gets all the glory. Evolution eliminates God from consideration. James Boyce uh, said, uh, evolution allows man to be the center of the universe. Another example of the arrogance of man is the separation the church and state as it's seen in our society today. In the book of Daniel, Nebuchadnezzar represents the state. He is the enemy of God. Nebuchadnezzar wants to rule over God and his creation. Daniel, on the other hand, wants to follow the will of God. Daniel is a member of the church, the ecclesia, those called out by God. When the doctrine of the separation of the church and state was formulated, it simply meant that the church and state functioned separately. They each did their own thing. They had authority in certain areas, and they were not allowed to meddle in other areas. The state did not appoint rulers in the church, or should not. And the the church should not rule over secular society which means worldly society. It didn't mean that pious individuals shouldn't take their faith in God into the boardroom or the legislative chambers. It didn't mean that Christians should not respect secular authority. It simply meant that the secular and ecclesiastical worlds had different areas of authority. For instance, the church should not have the power to perform capital punishment. Those deemed in need of it were handed over to the state to perform the punishment. In both cases of the church and state, both were seen as having to answer to God. The church answered to God. The state answered to God, was subservient to God. They were two different bodies serving the same master, the Lord and creator of the universe. In both areas, The leaders are fulfilling God-appointed duties. Now today, the world sees this idea of separation of church and state, at least in our society, to mean that the church has nothing to do with the state and should have nothing to do with state and shouldn't meddle in any secular affairs. Many professing Christians hold this view. But of course, the secular community has no problem forcing its agenda upon the church. You can look to Canada where they tell the church what they can and cannot preach about, no matter what the Word of God says. They want to make sure that those renegade church members aren't bringing their religion into debates or governance or education. The state, to many, has become supreme. Man makes the state its God. Might makes right, after all. And the state has the power. So the state keeps religious matters out of governance. Those mentioning a right to life are seen as religious fanatics. Religion is perfectly acceptable to the state as long as it's kept in check, not taken out of the closet when not in church. Heaven forbid a Christian tries to bring his religious convictions into the real world. Nebuchadnezzar thought he was master of his world. It's no wonder that in the great works of St. Augustine, the city of God and the city of man, the city of man is called Babylon. 
The king thought himself superior to all men, and he was judged for it. He was judged for thinking that he was above God. When man takes the glory of God away for themselves, God will react in his time. Nebuchadnezzar thumbed his nose at God, but Daniel and his friends did not. Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah are citizens of the city of God. They yearn to live for God. And they're the ones, though small in nature, doing simple things and standing firm for God make all the difference. They have faith in the Lord and they live it out. Time and time again in this wonderful book, we see Daniel standing up for God. Not out of pride, not to be a cause of friction and to make himself noticed. When you look at the book, Daniel's trying not to be noticed. He just wants to live a pious life and he wants to serve the king of Babylon. He's living out of faith, and a desire to be devout and an assurance that it is much more important to live your life for God and with God than it is to be at peace with the Lord. It's better to lose your life for God than to live your life for the world. Every aspect of Daniel's life that we see is lived out in oppression by a secular nation that was out to get him. The people were jealous of him and his friends, and they tried to stay as, as they tried to stay as close to the will of God as they were able to, while still serving the king that had enslaved them, and serving very well with their God-given talents something we often forget today. So often Christians today want to throw off the burden of the secular world. They want to defy the authorities. But that's not what we see Daniel and his friends doing. They, of course, won't defile themselves or worship idols, but they will serve the will of the king that has captured them. And they will do so to the best of their ability. And that's what we are to do as Christians today. We aren't supposed to deny the authority of the nations or the states or the cities. We are supposed to be the best of citizens. One thing that is often forgotten is that the confessions of the Protestant Reformation were in large part written to assure those in power, the king and their governors, their princes, that the Protestants were still good citizens, that they were the true church that they were followers of Christ the Lord. We too should be confessing our faith in God and His Son Jesus Christ while saying that we are good citizens of the world. Take heart in knowing that the Lord is in charge. He is sovereign over all, and it is He who appoints those in power over us. He does so for our own good. He does so to hold back the wickedness of man. Just as in the time of Daniel, man may think that he's the one that deserves the glory, that he's in charge of things. Man may think that he's in charge of creation. Man apparently thinks that he can control the weather. But it is God who is in control. It is the Lord who gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into the hands of Nebuchadnezzar. It was the Lord that allowed the temple in Jerusalem to be plundered. Men may fool themselves into thinking that they have eternal glory. They may fool themselves into thinking that they are God. But they will never be God. They will never be in charge of creation. They will never have that eternal glory they so yearn for. Those that detract from an early date of authorship say that the book of Daniel must have been written later by someone unknown using a pseudonym and that it must have been written during the time of Antiochus Epiphanes. I bring this up because of his name. Antiochus Epiphanes means Antiochus, God manifest just as many rulers did in ancient times and still do today, Antiochus thought he was God. He thought he was divine. 
I think Nebuchadnezzar thought that he was as close to a god as you could get. But he was just a man. A man in rebellion against God. A man in rebellion receives condemnation. So you don't have to be that man. You can walk with Daniel in the company of men like Abraham who believed and it was accounted to him as righteousness or David who was a man after God's own heart because that is where David's faith was laid. They were all looking for God. They were all looking to God. They were praising their God. They were devoted to to God. They were living for God. They were seeking to do His will and they were looking forward to the coming of the Christ. And you can be in their company by placing your faith in Jesus Christ, your Lord and Savior. If only you believe and trust in Him, then His kingdom is yours. Daniel's writings ring just as true today as they did over 2,500 years ago. Because They are the Word of God. He is the Lord God Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. The Lord of all creation. Come to Him. Believe in Him and live through His Son, Jesus Christ. For the Lord takes pleasure in His people. He will beautify the humble with salvation. Psalm 149, verse 4. Come to Him. Leave this world behind. Receive salvation through Jesus Christ, your Lord. Amen. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we are amazed by your sovereignty, by your might. Lord, never let us forget that you are in charge no matter what happens, no matter the trials that we face, no matter the oppression of this life, you are in charge. You are sovereign over all creation. And we are your children. We live for you. Gracious Father, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift His countenance upon you and give you peace. Go out love and serve your Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy 